Welcome to Afros in the Diaspora. My name is Sarah. I am your host. And together we will vent, rant, laugh, and cry as we discuss the highs and lows of being an immigrant. Stay tuned for stories that will inspire, inform, entertain, and give hope. This is Afros in the Diaspora. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Afros in the Diaspora. And today we have the multiple award winning multidisciplinary artist, Makambe (laughs) Casey Mamba. She's an award winning playwright. She's an amazing actor, producer. Hey, Makambe, welcome. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have you. Oh, my goodness. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know what? I think the timing is divine. I trust exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes. So we're going to dive right into the icebreakers. And I'm going to start with the riddle. Okay. Uh, let me. It's a, it's, it's a little bit of a long one, but you got this. Right? I hope so. It's like, you, you, you got this. Um, okay, let me start. I have no voice, and yet I speak to you. I tell of all things in the world that people do. I have leaves, but I am not a tree. I have pages, but I am not a bride or royalty. I have a spine and hinges, but I'm not a man or a door. I have told you all. I cannot tell you more. What am I? Ooh, am I a book? You are a book! Yes, I am a book! Is yeah. it more ways than one? I claim it. <laughs> yes, yes, that was, qu- I'm telling you, that's the quickest anyone has ever gotten a riddle on this thing. <laughs> oh, you know what messed me up? The part where it was like, I'm not a tree. I'm like, you're not! <laughs> <laughs> that was good. You were like, am I a book? Like, yes, yes, you are. I, oh. And again, award-winning playwright. She deals with books, people. So obviously, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so my next question is going to be, what about Zambia? So I need you, Makambe, to tell me. By the way, when last were you in Zambia, if I may ask? I was there. Oh gosh, three months ago. Okay. Yeah. All right. was so there recently. Three months ago. Now okay. I'm really nervous. Oh gosh. No. <laughs> Fear not. Do not be afraid. Uh, who is the president of Zambia? And when did he come into power? Simple, right? Easy. Light work. Um, the president of Zambia is me. <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I came into power in this exact moment. <laughs> um, yeah. That's oh, that's, oh, that's your answer? answer. You're sticking with my, it? Okay. That is my final answer. Okay. So the president of Zambia is, I call him Uncle HH. Okay. Um, but he's Hakainde Hichilema. And I call him Uncle because I felt like of all the, of the Zambian present, presidents who came before, I just was like, you know how sometimes politicians, you're just like, great, another one. Like, you're just like, cool. <laughs> what is the face of the person who's going to steal the natural resources of my nation today? Lord, like, you know, yeah. like. But like, yeah, with him, I felt like a different kind of hope and a, a different kind oh, okay. of, um, I'm like, oh, maybe this is going to be better for us. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so that's Uncle HH. Okay. And when did he come into power? I would like to say January-ish, 2021? 2021, yes, August Oh, that's way off. <laughs> I don't know where I get January from, but yes, okay. I because I remember, I just remember the conversations around that election. I remember like a lot of people's concerns and like usually because I had just visited right before mm-hmm. the end of 2020. So it was like really cognizant in my mind and like the campaigning and it was COVID and there was all this drama because he was trying to campaign this side, then the other uncle who was in power was like, You can't do that, you're gonna go to jail for a bit. And he was like, Oh, and then everyone was like you can't send him to jail like also what about the price of a bag of flour and everyone was like really upset so there's something about when you're home and you're really invested in it so yeah. kind of present in my brain and he posted Sampa the great on his instagram i said this is my president this okay this is my president these are the ones the vibes are 
the vibes are right with this president. <laughs> yeah, so good. But we got to keep an eye on them all, you know, because sometimes I know. you step I mean, into these places of service. And some people, I think the African politicians are wild. <laughs> Uh, you know when you were you were describing this new hope that you have for Zambia, I was like, I wish I could relate with Nigeria. Like we just had, I think the the our last election was last year, and girl, oh my gosh, uh, that's that's where I'll leave it. I'll leave it right yeah, there. It's humbling. <laughs> At, it's oh humbling. my god, that's 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 all I got. I I, I have only prayers. Um, at this point but yeah no thank you for engaging with me in those icebreakers um Mm -hmm. if you could just tell us a little i know we've established that you're from zambia but if you could just tell us a little bit about your immigration story of you know from Mm -hmm. being born in zambia to living life here in canada in toronto you know it's been it's been a few lots of hops skips and jumps so yes born in zambia um and I think Zambia is my, my my biggest home and always will be, but I've lived lots of other places. I'm, I'm really happy and lucky and proud to have many homes. So yes, yeah, Zambia was the first home. When I was seven, um, my family and I, we moved to Guyana in South America for two years. And like, I, I look back at my parents' decision and energy to like do that with us so it's like myself my older brother um my younger brother my younger sister wasn't even born at the time like I just, I'm like I can barely clean my house sometimes how are these people working full-time jobs and like carrying us all the way to different hemispheres like it really blows my mind yep so we yeah we lived in Guyana for two years which was like a magical I just found it so magical and interesting and seven-year-old me was like okay I'm in America but not the America on TV this is a different America this one's called South and like I see lots of people who look like me but they don't sound like me I was just and I was like what is all this food like I was Guyana was a vibe as a seven-year-old um so we lived there for two years because my dad had um uh, like a like a, a contract with the government for two years he's a, a lawyer um and he, so he worked for the government like a legislative drafter so he would like write laws so he had like a little two-year contract or offer there and he was like let's do it cute with the intention of going back to Zambia but at the end of that contract another job opportunity came up and it led us to the British Virgin Islands which Um, we lived there for six years, which was also magical in its own right. Like literally like the most like pristine beaches, very, very small, like, like very, very like small communities. Um, but like, yeah, I also had like a very magical time there. I was a teenager, so I was a bit of a jerk sometimes. And I was like, I just want to go to boarding school in Colorado. And my mom was like, oh my God. (laughs) Like, I just was like, I don't want to be here. I don't I I hate it here. I hate this island. But (laughs) I think at that age, I was just going to hate anything because that's what my hormones were doing. Um, so yeah, the British Virgin Islands, specifically Tortola was home for six years. Um, and I miss it dearly and I haven't been back since, um, It just hasn't worked out, but I can't wait to do that. So after that, um, so by this point, I think after this opportunity came around, I think my parents kind of changed the intention of like that we're going to go back home because now I think we're getting older. And I also think like the uh, intention to send us to school in the West to be able to be working in the West and then pay like the, you know, the U.S. dollar school fees or whatever was going to be easier from um, working this side rather than going back home I think was part of the calculation so after the Virgin Islands when it's like okay we're not going back and the next place with the intention of like let's settle here was the Cayman Islands which was also like a very different adventure like it was like it's interesting to go from different like to go from these different Caribbean nations and see what felt similar and what felt different and just to be able to observe what they sounded like here what were the specific differences between the accent of like Caymanians versus Jamaicans versus people on Tortola versus like, I just, I think it's part of the reason I'm an artist because I'm so fascinated with just humans. So the Cayman Islands was home for a few years and I finished high school there. And so while I was in Cayman, that's when I was like applying for like universities and, and, and whatnot. So I applied to some schools in the States and also in Canada. Around that time, my family got permanent residency for Canada so that meant that I had to go to school in Canada and I was like what even is that place (laughs) like I just was like 
how did you worry people what's going on what mm-hmm. eh? and like I just had no sense I had no sense of Canada at all like like really like I just knew that sometimes like in sort of in the Caribbean like like diaspora communities that I would live in because I went to like always like international schools so we always had you know people from different places I'm like Oh, the Canadians. Those are the Americans who say they're not Americans because they all sounded the same to me, right? So mm-hmm. um, anyway, Canada ended up being uh, the place that we were supposed to settle because Cayman, um, just for many different reasons, didn't work out, even though the intention was to like, we're going to be here and stay. So my first home in Canada is actually in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Um, I was studying journalism and I... Um, yeah, did a year and a half there. I didn't plan to do that. I meant to actually go to Montreal at uh, Concordia University to study creative writing, but I didn't get into the program. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was the only school I had initially applied to. And then my mom and I had a very big fight and she was like, you have to apply to other schools as a backup. And I was like, you don't even know how this works. And then you see how I didn't get into the next school that I wanted to (laughs) go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the backup schools were like the University of Regina <laughs> in Regina, Saskatchewan, another mm-hmm. hopping <laughs> destination, and the University of Prince Edward Island, because I put no thought or awareness into it, because I was super confident I would get into my first school, and then I didn't. So ended up at Prince Edward Island, because I was like, it's an island, so I guess I'll go there, because I've been in islands before. It literally was my logic. Went there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, did a year and a half there and then ended up transferring and deciding that I want to study drama I ended up in Lethbridge Alberta for my drama degree which was the most random I don't like when I look back at my story I don't even know what's wrong with me like or how I make these decisions or what really makes me feel called but ended up in Lethbridge Alberta with the intention of like okay I'm gonna go to Toronto to finish my degree but there was just a little bit of a something to do with like the way that schools work and then drama schools it's like you need to certain schools need you to audition at a certain time and then if you miss that cutoff you have to wait for the next year so it was like I'm either gonna have a gap year where I'm not doing anything and I'm waiting to audition for drama school which is literally my African mother's nightmare I, th- I don't know if that woman slept she was just like what <laughs> <laughs> um and so it was like between that or like go somewhere else and like do a different degree and then transfer like things weren't making sense so Lethbridge was the only place that would let me start taking acting classes without auditioning first so I ended up there with the intention of transferring to Toronto because by this time now my family like my mom my brother and my sister and my other brother had moved to Toronto or Brampton to be more specific and um I got to Lethbridge and I really loved it I just that's exactly where I was supposed to be so finished my degree there ended up in Calgary um and sort of did the thing there tried to move to Vancouver it didn't take came back after a month and a half it was one of those things where um I'm like hire me, hire me, give me jobs. And I felt like I was really just like beating down doves. Like I felt like I was really pounding the pavement. Um, and I understand that's a thing that a lot of people experience when they start, but I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. And then I like went to Vancouver and it feels like the moment I went to Vancouver, Calgary was like, hey, you want some jobs? And I was like, I wanted them three years ago when I tried to have yeah. coffee with you and you didn't give me. Uh. Yes. So went back to Calgary for a few years and kind of sort of got my momentum going there and then decided that the next stop was Toronto. And that's where I am right now. That's where you find me today. Oh my goodness. Thank you. First of all, I relate to the, because I have an Nigerian mother too. And I, <laughs> I was going to study theater arts. First of all, um, what, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, you know, I just, for, for, I think that was like the first time in my life I ever stuck by my guns with my parents or stuck to my guns. How do you say that? Anyway, but with my parents, cause usually they're like, do this. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. But this time around, I just was like, I, we die here. As a Nigerian man, we stay. We die here. You see this theater arts? You see me see you ladies. I'm already in the school. I'm already there. I'm already studying the theater arts. Whether you pay for it or you don't pay. In fact, my God will not even allow you not to pay for it. I am going to that school, right? So it was, I experienced that like tension definitely with my mom. My dad was my very dear friend. My dad's like, if you want to go and sell pure water on the road, just do it well. <laughs> 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 just do it well. That was my oh, mother's word. If, um, go- if you want to study how to sell tomatoes in the market, just don't waste my money. Just do it well. Whatever you want to do, Sha, just do it well. That was my father's own. But my mom, doctor, nurse, all those, you know, medical. Yeah. 
guess. But my destiny is not there now. What do you want to do? My destiny is not in nursing. My destiny is not in medicine at all. <laughs> at all. I cannot stand the sight of blood. Right. So she wanted me to stay at home that year, study again, go and do like the YEC or the GC exam again, then apply for university again. And and I was like, God forbid. <laughs> Good for you that you stuck to your guns, but that's not an easy thing to do. That very, I'm, very I hard. Know that was not a good year in your house. It was already... not. It was not. Up until I was in my second year, my mom was still buy, like paying for these exams for me to do. She was still buying me chemistry, physics textbooks. Up until second or third year in university. At this point, I was winning awards in school. I was doing really well in school. And they would call my mom over like, hey, your daughter is winning, is, you know, has been has been accepted for this award, whatever. Like, come and join her to accept the award. Like, they were inviting my parents to school to accept awards. And then eventually my mom was like, eh, maybe it is God's plan for you. <laughs> you know what's so funny is like what I hear in that story is like, I feel like God was like, you know, when he's like putting the souls together, he's like this one and this one, because what I'm hearing is that your your stubbornness is equally matched. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like the way she's also stubborn. She's like, I know you in this other program, learn all this other stuff in your third year, but I still saw some chemistry books on sale. I'm gonna get them for you. And the yeah. way you were like, I'm going to die. Like, it's so funny. <laughs> you guys deserve each other <laughs> like because like because any like literally most people in the world would have been so broken down by that of course oh, like, yeah and then like and then even just like respecting your parents and especially oh. coming from African cultures where we really we really say that stuff out loud like we really hold true to like even the way that language is formed and how you talk to your parents or how you talk yes. to your older sibling like yeah. so like I just that takes so much strength I'm so glad that you you push through. We're all so much. I am too. Holy Honestly, smokes. It was hard. Like my mom, called, the pastors were called. No, the, no. The neighbors were called. Every, I'm telling you, like my house was on fire that day. Like she called everyone. Talk to your daughter. Talk to your daughter. She must study. Um, uh, I said, Mio, you see this place here? This is where we die. I'm ready to die on this hill. Like, I never in my life had I ever, 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 ever stood up to my mom like that ever before. Right. So I'm sure she was surprised. I was trying like, to like... What possessed like, you? <laughs> That's why the pastors were called in. I'm telling you. <laughs> the whole other realm that we're dealing with. Yeah, I'm telling you. That's literally it. That's maybe what... Maybe that's why she called the pastors because like this... She's not acting her usual way because usually I'll just be like, okay, fine, okay, fine. But this time around, I was ready. I was ready. And of course, you know, very, very hard to do that. But yeah, so let's talk about your artistry and how you do the things you do, right? You're an immigrant. You li you've lived in so many amazing places, right? And now mm. here you are in Canada making art, telling stories, right? So like how, how, what has that been like for you in your professional career, right? As a writer, as an actor, as a performer, like what has that been like? for you embodying these roles, writing these characters, embodying your mm -hmm. blackness, Africanness, right? All these, um, the layers that make you who you are. Like how, what is the journey of accepting those things to the point of showing it back to the world in your artistry, in your writing, in your plays and things like that? How has that been? Oh my God. So damn good. It's been so good. It's been like literal, like, Dude, I'm so glad that I also like stuck to my guns and 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 I chose this path because I know for a fact this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, I really I really subscribe to the belief that like you are the representation of your ancestors here and now in this moment. Like they chose you. They were like, Makame, you go decide. You go to this weird town. Like I I really believe that, and I'm so glad that I showed up for the assignment. The journey itself can be like it's humbling sometimes. Sometimes there's like really tender parts of it feeling like, especially at this age now. So I'm 33. This is the age where I feel like I can sometimes compare myself to my friends in, in, in ways that are not always kind to myself because they like like we all graduated school around the same time that they're able to live lives of a stability, which is something that the older I get, the more I crave. And I don't have that. Like if they want to plan a squad trip, even if they're planning it two years from now, like sometimes I'm like, I would love that 
to happen, but I don't know if that's going to be a reality that I could be into. Like sometimes I'm like, drinks on me, drinks on me, who wants some more drinks? And other times I'm like, drinks on you, please. (laughs) (laughs) Please. (laughs) I feel like I live in this place where I have like, like awards and like a resume that I'm really proud of. And like, like there's like, I've done a lot of things, but really what matters is like what you're doing next. And so there's like certain times when it gets like really slow, it can be really humbling. So I'll give you an example of like what the highs and lows can look like, even when you're in a place of kind of like, I would say even just self-defined, like I think I'm in a place of privilege and success within my, within my career, but like sometimes it's like, okay, like, I wrote this award-winning show called Our Father's Sons, Lovers, and Little Brothers, which means so much to me. And also is like, it's the kind of project, like, I was lucky to get, like, interest and support to uh, write it and work on it and that, like, people took interest in me and, like, nurtured me. But even if they hadn't, I still would have made the thing. If I never made a dollar for the thing, I still would have figured out a way to make the thing. So to be able to, like, have that and actually, like, make money off of that and actually, like, connect with people, that is incredible. So I, I toured that. Um, for a couple of months and then the next year which was this which was oh, it's 2024 now crazy okay in 2023 in the beginning of 2023 I started off with another tour with this piece which is when we did like Saskatoon Winnipeg Kitchener and Montreal and so it's like I was like on top of the world like touring my own um show and like a lot of Canadian plays don't get that long of a life don't get that many productions and like just the fact that it was also like a blackity black show do blackity black stuff and that was that I was in it and kind of like doing things that I didn't see um done a lot in 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 other sort of ways like even I was playing a teenage boy which is not my not my gender um and just like I felt like I was just doing the thing you know that was amazing and I also decided that this was the year that I was gonna like pivot a little bit away from theater and be like and now I'm gonna go conquer film and tv literally what happened this last year strike on strike on strike strike please (laughs) Strike, <laughs> double strike, like yeah. yeah. So literally, kind of like I was like, okay, I'll finish. I finished my tour in May. Did another show in Calgary. In when was that? Was that May? Yes. Um, and then came back to Toronto. I was like, I'm gonna take like about a month or three weeks off to just sort of um not work, and then I'll sort of dive into like TV and film auditions because it's usually really busy in that industry in the summer. And then the writers mm-hmm. went on strike, and the actors went on strike, and like don't get me wrong I'm very I think that those strikes needed to happen and I know that it will be better on the other side however that was like I was depending on booking something within that space or a few things within that space to help me keep afloat so like the whole rest of the year did not end up looking the way that I wanted it to and so that meant that I had to make certain uh uh sacrifices financially it meant that like theater work that I was turning down now I was like oh maybe like I shouldn't have turned that down and so there was like big ups and big sort of like downs within this industry and I feel like yeah. because I'm so uh, I have so much conviction about where I am and where I'm going so I, I I've always had the feeling like I just need to ride this out like it is just a period of time yeah. but I want to acknowledge that as I'm like celebrating that and talking about the success because that is the hard part it's not hard to be like my show did well my thing was published I got an award my mom has gave me a fat thumbs up like that's the easy part that's the part we all love but like the hustle that can have to happen between that the like networking the like believing in your idea so much that yeah. like when you're getting no and no and no to just really find your center and just be like I know I'm supposed to do this to have that kind of like it's really a crisis of faith really mm-hmm. um that part has been like kind of like humbling and difficult but overall like wouldn't change a thing like I feel like I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do and I feel like what's exciting about this chapter is like so my definition of like exploitation is like when you're invited into any room and they're not inviting your full intelligence. So that is mentally and spiritually as well. And like heritageically, that's not a word, but like in terms of your heritage, in terms of like, who are your people? It's kind of like, you know, if you're asking a black person to, for example, do a certain role and not acknowledge what maybe the historical implications of that are, that's a form of exploitation. Like that, I just, it's like, 
a, a, an experience where I'm truly empowered invites all parts of myself into the experience because that person or that project or that thing wants me to draw from all parts of myself, not just this little one, which, you know, this one person can understand or this little one, which yeah. feels like to sort of categorize. So I feel like right now, I feel like I'm, I'm creating work where I'm inviting my full gamut of like intelligent experience in the room and finding other collaborators who um, resonate with that. So that's exciting. And just finding those people existing at different levels of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, I just love being a black little African baby, just like telling the stories that matter to me. And um, so I'm, I'm like thrilled to be here. It's hard sometimes, but it's also so good. I'm, I'm yeah. just very jazzed and inspired and excited also about this year and all the things that it'll bring. Yeah. And that is like, thank you said that so well. And you said a lot of things too, like that bit about exploitation that you said towards the end. I relate with that so much because I mean, first of all, I'm a, I'm a Nigerian based here in Canada. So yes, I relate to that. Right. And then, especially as a designer um, and I found this, I, it, I, I didn't even, how do I even describe this? Like when I first started out, which of, of which I feel like I'm still very, very much early career. I'm just starting. Um, it it was a weird expectation where it's like you're a designer and designer only. So it's like you're. I I felt like I was brought onto projects onto some projects as not a collaborator but as a designer that I don't know if that makes sense to you, but kind of like yeah. your work here is to um, shop for clothes and um, get, you know, the things we need for the set, not necessarily to collaborate with the process. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I've, I found myself in rooms like that and it's really, really, really tough um, because you cannot shut down a part of your existence because you find yourself in rooms like that. It's impossible to do that. And the fact that it seems to be, it sometimes seems to be, I mean, I'm not trying to generalize here at all. Um, it just seems to be sometimes a requirement when you find yourself in some rooms where it's like, okay, well, you're here as an, as a pair of eyes and a brain to shit out a design and we will use it. Like, I, I don't know if you, you understand what I'm saying, but like, I, can, I, I relate with that on the design end. And then um, when I started finding myself in rooms where they're like, you know, what are your thoughts? What, what do you think about this? How do you feel like the set will play into the realization of this conflict? And I'm like, me? <laughs> you know, I can use the entirety of my brain now. Like, you know, I can use the entirety of my being, my own lens and perspective of how I see this work and how I see this, like the design coming, you know, playing into the story and things like that, right? So um, yeah, th that's that's a very, very, very real one. And the ups and downs, oh my gosh. <laughs> what um for me I feel like when I graduated I didn't really have a full idea of what life as an artist was going to be like I I don't know what I thought it was but I I did not think it was as chaotic as it turned out to be for me yes. especially when I first started because I don't know I I, I was not I wasn't aware of how on like of the instability I guess like mm -hmm. I, I don't know that a professor or a teacher in class ever just kind of was real with us about yo when you get out of school first of all you will probably need to grab whatever day job you can get you will have to hustle work for no money da, da, da. like I don't think those expectations were were fully articulated for mm -hmm. for folks in class to just kind of have an idea that okay this thing I'm saying it does get better but you will have to build a resume build a net network you know collaborate with people and just meet people and put yourself out there put yourself out there put yourself out there and do the little work because the little work gives rise to the bigger work and it just kind of grows from there but I don't think anyone ever kind of gave it to us straight like that in school and so when I graduated I'm like okay now I'm ready to design where are the gigs and it, <laughs> it was such a rude awakening for me um but uh yeah. yeah man like the ups and downs like we artists like the the fact <laughs> the life of an artist is not straightforward and man <laughs> it, it just it just isn't I saw this Instagram um post where a person did a this weird uh interesting experiment right they it was two lanes so there's a ball on a straight flat lane 
and then there was another ball on a lane that had ups and downs like like um okay uh i don't know what to call it but just it went up and like it, grooves. it just yeah, yeah grooves yeah where it would go up and go down like yeah so and then they put those two balls side by side it was the same length of like same distance but mm-hmm. different like um one lane was flat and straight the other had you know grooves and went up and down um and then they put both balls and the ball on the lane that was that had the grooves moved faster than the ball on the straight lane and they were moving at the same like this starting distance right. sorry starting speed mm-hmm. and for me i was just like oh is this jesus trying to tell me something <laughs> because <laughs> like because that's it that's life as an artist it's uh, it's up and down and it's all over the place there's no straight you know straight line but um yeah can you tell us a bit about your what um because you've said you tell stories that are important and you know precious to you um can you share how that in a space like in North America for instance right there's a definition of blackness that we do not necessarily fit into completely anyway um there's this certain like there's a certain <laughs> set in my Nigerian accent is like come on <laughs> so there is a certain like (laughs) there's a certain expectation when people see like black stories being told there's a certain aesthetic that they're used to there's a certain narrative they're used to there's a certain um cultural um storytelling that they're used to how Mm -hmm. have you navigated that as a playwright and a storyteller that kind of breaks that box and you're like no i'm zambia and and i'm like you know standing in your full identity having lived in all these places um and the fact that they are a part of you and now you find yourself in this um space in canada where in north america where um there's there is an idea of blackness that is true and valid and beautiful right but then that is not the end all be all of blackness so how have you navigated that in your storytelling and artistry yeah I mean it it really makes me feel so grateful for having grown up around different black experiences um culturally first of all because um I know a lot of um, African people will relate to this, but like African countries are so culturally diverse and I don't think people um, who are not on the continent have a full appreciation of like how diverse all of these different tribes, you know, the, the word tribes actually feels like I don't have a problem. Word. Yeah, I don't have a problem yeah. with, with that word, but it's actually like what, what like kingdoms, countries, nations, right? Mm-hmm. Like all of these, and sometimes we were beefing with each other too. Like sometimes we were not. We had historical beefs, mm-hmm. beefs, chickens and stews with mm-hmm. our neighbors for all of these <laughs> different sorts of reasons, yeah. right? Like so, so, so. I think it was just like I come from a, a country where I saw that the like that like human beings all come in different um come with different histories right and that was Mm. easily uh represented in zambia by language um so for the most part each tribe has its own language so my mom is lozi so mom's side speaks to lozi my dad is mixed with two tribes he's tonga and ila so i already had a sense as a person i'm already living a mixed identity not mixed in the way that we talk about it in north america because they're like people be like you look really black yeah yeah (laughs) nobody's white within you (laughs) and like mixed means more than that but so I already had sort of like that awareness of like that like uh, that different culture like that looking similar does not mean that you're actually experiencing the same thing then that was um magnified even just like as a seven-year-old in Guyana because I, I just would see people who looked African, like they look African, but like they had a very different life experience. They had a very different way of speaking and relating and seeing the world. And so I've just always carried an awareness of that diversity of perspectives. And sometimes I do talk to Black folks who have only kind of like lived in one place and I see how different it is, our ideas of like what Blackness is, whatever that is. Like some people really feel like to be Black is whatever it looks like to be Black in whatever town they lived in whether that town is New York City or whether that town is Tabor, Alberta or whatever the case may be. And I just, I've always had an awareness of that. 
Um, and I've always had a, I always feel like sell it. Like I'm the African person. I'm like all black people, even those of you who are like Africa. Mm, like, I just feel like, you know, some of the diaspora, some of our diaspora cousins are a little bit, it's kind of shady towards us. Mm. You too, Lawrence, come home, <laughs> come home. Lawrence. Like you're never not going to be my cousin, exactly. Clarence, you know, whatever yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm that African person who's just like, like, there's certain people I'm, I've met, certain Africans who are like, Caribbean Black people are not African. And I'm like, I think they are. No, no, <laughs> like, they actually are home. historically. I literally come home. Like, yeah. and I get it. And I get that, like, my relationship to Africa is going to look a bit different. But I, different. Re- I literally think, are you Black? You're African. Come home. So mm-hmm. I've always found, I always feel like a cousinship. And what I noticed as a young person was that not everybody feels that cousinship. Like, even in the Caribbean, like I would like just like the super nasty comments from like black Caribbean kids about me being African, me being dirty. Me, you know, those are the same people who when who are Wakanda and forever, whenever a new black panther comes out. And I'm just like, I remember you. Thank you for realizing that you're my cousin. Like, why are we fighting? This is so stupid. Yeah. So having that awareness, I think, has just naturally been a part of my work. So um, and I felt like I, I'm, I'm grateful to feel a, a, a great amount of access to like Africa, African storytelling. I know how I fit into that, similar to like my Caribbean upbringing, because I actually lived in the Caribbean longer than I lived in Zambia. So I have a, an access and a connection to that. I also have an access to like Black American, not Canadian American sort of narratives. I know that's super, super broad just because of the way in which they dominated like what we had access to in terms of black media. Like I have a sense, like I have a sense of what the stoop in Harlem is like. I have a sense of that um, farm in the South where, you know, this black family has been for generations. Like I have a sense of what those things are. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I've always felt that they were connected. And I think maybe even just like having the lack of access to like stories that are specifically about me and where I'm from and like with the hyper specificity of what I know that my cultural background is kind of makes me feel a- even more like excited to jump in and connect to like okay like we don't have any African stories but we have an August Wilson play right mm-hmm. for those who don't know like August Wilson is great like African-American oh play, right right like a uh, legend like, literally like wrote <sighs> What is the fences? He wrote, you he know? wrote fences. Yeah, he wrote oh. the. What was the one with where Chadwick Boseman was one of the Miss Ma Rainey's, uh Black Yeah, Black. yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, which was a film with Viola Davis. It's like, yeah. So I'm like, okay. So I we don't have any Lozi something something, but we have these cousins over here, and there's something about this experience that I get and I understand. So I've just always I'm just like all black people are my cousins, whether you like it or not. It used to really irritate people. I remember there was this there was this boys from your country <laughs> when I was in PEI. And I remember one of them was trying to holler at me, and I had no idea because I'm an alien and I don't live in the world and I don't catch on to these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember he was like trying to hit on me, and I was just like, "Wow, brother, wow, cousin." And he got so <laughs> much. He's like, "What, the brother? I'm not your cousin." And I'm like, "It's only years later." I was like, "Oh God, she was trying to holler, poor man." <laughs> Sorry, Tom, wherever you are. Sorry, Sorry I didn't know. I man. didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just all that is so funny. I'm yeah. That spirit. And then, so being Black in Canada is interesting because I think that what dominates uh, uh, Black narratives is like a Black American, not Canadian narratives. Like, there's, there's connections for sure, big connections between these are obviously really general terms, but like, but like black experiences in American black experiences in Canada and they're connected and interweaved with each other. But like, I think that the awareness of like how much that gets like, that like blackness gets painted with such a broad brush. I don't think people really understand, including a lot of black folks, how broad that painting is. Like mm. not like, like the, it comes with assumptions about, um, uh, uh, experiencing racism and experiencing racism all your life which is not the 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 case for a lot of black folks especially immigrants who come from places where everyone looks like them so they don't experience racism in that way mm-hmm. there's also a huge um, assumption about class um tv and movies and the way people talked about blackness made me feel like i i, I didn't grow up poor enough mm-hmm. <laughs> i grew up with a little too much i'm like huh yeah I was like, oops and sometimes people would like <laughs> kind of make assumptions about things that I did or did not have access to which 
I think sometimes I kind of like, I, I, I'm sure there's probably stories of like me leaning into that for whatever was advantageous. It's not yeah. a very high vibrational thing to do, but I'm, I'm sure I've, I'm sure I've done it because as I was just like processing all of this. So mm-hmm. what I feel is like, I, I feel like it's important for me to continue to have that awareness and like sense of cousinship with all of different parts of the African diaspora, because whether or not you want to be my cousin, you my cousin and I'll love you even if you don't like me sometimes. Mm-hmm. And what's refreshing and also sometimes challenging about telling stories from that perspective in a Canadian lens. It's like, first of all, there's just not that many black stories. Like when I look at like, like even like, so I'll speak mostly about theater because that's my main sort of place where I work. But like, even if you look at like just Canadian plays, even written by white people and like people of like, or even like white, like white immigrants or immigrants of different places, like the amount of stories that are Canadian that, we tell on Canadian stages versus American or British, like you'd be surprised at how little Canadian content actually um, exists in this like Canadian theater space. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like there's such little, there's so few black stories that have been told. And then on top of that, much less like ones that I really feel aligned in, there's a sense of freedom I feel. And I'm like, I'm just going to be really specific about the thing. But Um, for me, it's all about like acknowledging what my relationship is to the cousinship of all of these different parts when they're not exactly mine. So Mm -hmm. when I uh, wrote Our Father's Sons, Lovers and Little Brothers, which is um, a play that is inspired by my imagination of the afterlife of Trayvon Martin, I like traveled to the States because I felt like it was manners to just go there and like meet some cousins and hang out with some cousins and talk to some cousins about the things because I know and I have read a lot and I and I watched a lot of movies and (laughs) I watched Roots and I feel like I feel like in my brain I feel like I know a lot about what it feels like to be black in America but the truth is I know some of it but there's a lot that I don't know there's a lot that I don't know and I know it through the lens of I'm a person who literally like if Canada kicks me out I literally know that I can go to Zambia and I will be on my ancestral land and I get I have the privilege of of choosing do you want to go on the dad's side because we still have this land so me Makambe when I watch Roots when I watch 12 Years a Slave when I watch all of these you know stories that specifically speak to like that um, reality or even it's not just about like slave narratives but even if it's just like if Beale Street could talk whatever it is that I'm watching right I have an awareness of watching that through the fact that like I know that I still have the privilege of like I literally a few months ago was on my grandfather's ancestral land I literally mm-hmm. we still have it mm-hmm. like and my grand on my mom's side too like my great great I think eight great grandmas ago I have to do that math again but like yes we there's like a connection to the royal family on that side and that's a thing that I could still like sure. pursue yeah. you know what I mean like I have that like that's a, that's the thing I walk through like I got on the subway and I know that like I'm a princess like I have that on my dad's mm-hmm. side chief Simamba anybody who's a Simamba is related to me because Mamba is like an area so the chief of Chief of Mamba, Chief Simamba is where the, the word comes from. So like, he's actually a chief in the tribe. So there's like, like, I actually just have that. Like I could literally go and be like, here's my ID. I'm your cousin. They'd be like, hi, here's, I don't know. Well, I don't want to speak for them. But like, here's some land. Yeah. <laughs> it may not be that easy, but like right. walking through the world and having that, knowing that I have a place like that, that's not something that my African-American friends have in the same way. Mm-hmm. So we're not going to watch those things in the same way because I can, there's, there's a privilege in being able to track what my background is and to be able to literally go there and lift up the earth in my hands. Anyway, all that is to say is that as a storyteller, that awareness is, is, is really freeing for me. I I feel, I feel really free in being able to, um, to, I feel free in being able to like articulate that. I do sometimes come up with challenges where I feel like people like I have sometimes had people like early in my career kind of try to like, um, they didn't understand what I was doing. And I think uh, they dismissed some of my creative impulses, um, maybe because they didn't understand them, maybe because they were racist, um, maybe because I wasn't fitting in, I wasn't articulating it in through a narrative lens of what they were used to seeing, even like the myriad of like American black stories, which is also broad. Like, 
I could, I did feel a bit of like resistance or bumping up against that. But there's a part of me that also goes, you know what? Like, I don't know if you ever heard this um, phrase or like this idea, but it's basically like, God didn't give them the vision. He gave you the vision. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not necessarily their job to fully get it in the way that you'll get it. I mean, if you're gatekeeping and you still don't get it and I've explained it to you nicely, then I get upset because I'm like, give me some grant money so that I can make the thing. But it makes me so excited because I, when I know that when I hit on something that's like really specific and really poignant, like I can see how that resonates in black communities and non-black communities. Like it's actually like, like when the thing resonates, it's actually bigger than race. Like when you get, when you, when you get to the soul thing, it's actually, it actually transcends that in, in a different way. So that's the thing I'm chasing. So I have a great awareness of like the fact that like so many spaces that I work in aren't built for me. And I just decided I'm going to be very excited about it. Like, mm-hmm. I'm gonna be like, I'll be the one because my ancestors told me to be here in this boardroom in this white, white theater. And I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to play my Afro beats. And you can't tell me not to play David O. You can't tell me anything because I know, like, I know that people like me weren't here before, but I just feel strongly that I'm supposed to be here right now. Mm-hmm. So I've been lucky enough to have some people along the way, um, a lot of people of color who are like a generation older than me to be able to be like, yes. And so that's some of the ways I feel like some doors were open for me in order for me to be taken seriously, which is what happened with our fathers. Felt like I had another woman of color, a non-Black woman being like, yes, like make the thing. I'm going to produce the thing and make the thing the way you want to make the thing. I'm not going to come in and try and tell you how to make it. And that, Mm. that was the biggest gift that she could have ever given me. And I wasn't getting that kind of trust at like from like white institutions or white leaders, even people who are like mentoring me and trying to support me. I wasn't getting that trust of like trusting my soul to be like, however it is that you want to make the thing, make the thing the way you want to make the thing. We don't always give that power to young artists. We don't. Yeah. Oh so it's goodness. been like cool. I'm so lucky that I uh, and so appreciative that I got that opportunity. And I try to sort of empower artists coming after me with that kind of sensibility and being like, you make the thing the way you want to make the thing. Whether or not other everyone else will like it is not necessarily, it doesn't have to be your business if you don't want it to be. But like, mm-hmm. I guarantee you, if you make something and you delight yourself and you like, you touch your own heart, then you're going to touch other people's hearts. I yeah. think. Yeah. And I, I, Yes, 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 yes. I think that like something really, really cool that you said is that when you hit on that, that the heart of the story to where it transcends race and it's just about humanity, like it just it resonates because we are humans, right? Yeah. There We have differences for sure, but, but we do have more things that we can all relate to that make us one, you know? And yeah. like even the the subject of being an immigrant, like it, Canada is a mosaic of cultures. First of all, it's extremely multicultural, yeah. both you know with people of color and people that are like predominantly white people, right? So like even the people that are people move here from Europe and from you know France, and much. Australia, all the all the other places, mm-hmm. right? Um, but 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 the the idea of displacement is we all relate to it the idea of missing home we all relate to it the idea of being here you know looking for opportunities looking for this and that we relate to it while their skin color may give them a leg up versus us right that some of those ideas those threads just they it's 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 very common it's a very common thread right um Mm -hmm. and and I think that's the thing about artistry it's like while I feel like in my own lane that there are just not enough of our stories like Canada for it to be this multicultural space does not have multicultural stories being told right a lot of these stories are ignored silenced and untold and they should be told they're just as valid right the U.S., Canada there's so many immigrants there's so many Africans who have chosen to move there and I don't feel like the representation is there when when it comes to the arts, when it comes to films, movies, stories, mm-hmm. plays. Like I don't I don't think it's there, right? So for me, that's one of my driving forces of like we deserve to be heard, we deserve to be yeah. seen. Like we are legitimate kids of this soil. We're not, you know, the bastard sons of the father that people talk about behind doors and in whispers. Like we deserve to be 
yeah. our, our space, right? To be spoken about loud and proud. Um, but yeah, I, I, and sometimes like it, it just, it, it really is a gift when you get, when you receive that kind of validation when someone's like, yo, I believe in what you're doing and here's the space, time, money, energy, you know, support in whatever yeah. way to do it as you feel led to, as you want to create it. We don't always get that. <laughs> Like, like I look back, oh my gosh, Catherine Hernandez, who's like an incredible queer Filipinx novelist now, like she started off in theater and like ran the current performing arts for a couple of years, uh, which mm-hmm. was when she produced Our Fathers. And then like now it's just like writing award winning novels. She's just literally, I'm obsessed with her. Anyway, I call her auntie because I was like, you'll never get rid of me. Yeah. <laughs> I just think of like the the wisdom to know that that I knew what I was doing and that I yes I did need support and guidance but none of that had to do with telling me how to do the thing what I actually needed and what my best mentors within that process did was they gave me permission because you're used to being a student you're used to being you put your artistic things into this thing and then a professor comes and they tell you okay yes you did good or you didn't do good or this part was like like it takes a while to break your head like I feel like I don't know anybody who's like a working, thriving, like capital A artist who like finished theater school and has not spent every day since then somehow like deconstructing what they learned in that arts institution, you know, especially I feel like, you know, for for other institutions, maybe like, I feel like in med school, I don't know, I haven't been, but like, (laughs) like, sorry, African moms, neither of us have been to med school. But like, I would have met like there's certain things I'm like, yeah, you probably don't need to deconstruct the way cells float in blood you see why you don't want us to be doctors i don't even know how to right. i don't even know how to make this joke because i know so- <laughs> <laughs> but like um there's so much like unpacking that kind of i feel like i've had to do since since school to be able to actually give myself permission to actually be free and to be yeah. actually to actually like break rules and i yeah. and i um it's so uh amazing when people um can see and just like support that and i love I love that, like, I love the way that my path has unfurled. And I love that I'm like a person who now, at a, like now that things are shifting, now that there's like more intentions, sometimes clunky, but still nevertheless intentions to tell more diverse stories. And I actually get to play African women. Like I'm literally in heaven. And I think to myself, if you had told me 10 years prior to now, like, like, what it's about yeah I guess I graduated from theater school 10 years ago like this is not the way that the industry was trending um and just like even what people said about like oh like you're gonna play a maid or like oh like I remember getting a lead role in my last year of theater school and they were like someone was like oh this is the last lead role this person's gonna get for a while like there was just like there was just some shenanigan things that people thought were okay to say um and I think like I'm so glad that I stuck to it because now let me let me tell you let me tell you a little story about the last year of my theater school so I uh so so Pepper Theater which is here in Toronto um did like a a a world not a worldwide like a countrywide tour like audition kind of interview tour and they had uh, an academy which has looked different over the years but that particular year um, they basically wanted to make like a little mini theater company of like emerging artists. So you'd have to be like just coming out of school. I think you couldn't be older than 25. So it was like young artists, but like old enough. It's like you've been in plays, like, you know, some things, right. You're not like I'm 16. Right. So you usually yeah. have to like graduated school. So it's a very specific age group. Um, and they auditioned literally from like Vancouver to Newfoundland. Like they, they went across and um, they auditioned or slash met with over 600 plus artists. I I just remember these numbers really well. Yes. And then they called back 36 of those 600 plus. Oh my gosh. I was in the 36. Okay. So they came, so they, it was something like, it was like a certain amount of actors, a certain amount of designers, a couple of stage managers, producers. So it's essentially like, this squad could actually like we were gonna empower these people to be able to make theater and so they called us back flew us to toronto put us up in hotels i said this is what money was 
<laughs> especially like as you know sarah working in independent theater and how different that is in terms of what your budget is and what your ability is versus working in like an a house or like a big theater you know big like, theater, a, like yes. a citadel an arts club a theater calgary like it's yeah. just it's just different it's just different extremely dollars. different <laughs> so they like yeah they flew us in we had this um kind of weekend where like i was just i was there sort of in the acting stream but there was like other people sort of like we did scenes there's like exercises with all these things and at the end they cut that 36 in half or mm. 34 or 32 whatever the number was yeah they ended up with 16 people and I didn't make that final cut mm. and I just remember like oh I, I remember like where I was I remember like crying in my bed when I got the email and um I remember too, like when we had come to town, we had seen a show and it was, I think it was Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, which is like not Shakespeare, but it's like about two characters in Shakespeare and just seeing like a lot of classical uh, theater that this company was doing, like Shakespeare's, uh, Chekhov's, like Ibsen's, like a lot of like Pinter, <laughs> I don't know, like that kind of like classic theater. And yeah. I'm like, cool. And I remember how much I wanted to be part of that experience. And then it it, it wasn't meant for me. It is January 3rd. On January 15th, I'm starting rehearsals at Soul Pepper Theater for a show. So, yes, oh it gosh. gets better. Yeah. So, so I was there like two weeks ago or a couple weeks ago doing like a little, I was invited to do just like a little reading of like a new play that I'm working on, like a five minute reading. So they invited like six female playwrights and we just kind of read and sort of um, cheered each other on. And I had a full circle moment because the moment that the reading was in was the first place where we did the intros when I went there for the Academy callback. And I went, oh, it, I wasn't supposed to be there at that time. At that I was time. supposed to be here now. And guess what? So the play that I'm doing, it's called Three Sisters and it's an adaptation of Anton Chekhov's, you know, like OG Russian playwrights, mm -hmm. uh, Three Sisters. And it's a Nigerian adaptation. Ooh. So the backdrop is the Biafran War. And Ooh. that's... Do you understand? Do, like, do you understand like it's all for something? Like, mm. do you, like, do you understand that like little me, it's not even like I get to be a black girl from Alabama or Harlem, which is also like very excited to that. But like, I get to be like an African girl telling African stories about this conflict that happened so recently in our history yeah. that matters. Yeah. Like the scars of that are still. Oh my gosh. They're here. Fresh. They're here. They are here. They're like, still, do you know what I mean? Like, they're still bleeding for sure. And, and, and those who are close to it, of course, like, I, I, like, I'm sure you could tell me way more than I could tell you about it. But yeah. I, I just think of like, oh, like this is, and I'm like, this is exactly the play I'm supposed to be in. I'm not supposed to be in A Doll's House, which is a brilliant play. Like all of these other roles that I was super excited to, to do and wanted the opportunity to do that weren't for me. But I see how this one is for me. And I see like, and just like the enthusiasm and Sarah. Can I tell you, last week they sent us an email. They're like, oh, just if you guys want to get a head start on the dialect work, I'm like, to just see a breakdown of like the way you'd see in theater school, like, like, and then these, like this, in this kind of sound, we drop off the R or we say this like an AH or whatever to yeah. see that about a Nigerian dialect. And I'm not even Nigerian, but the way it's just, it makes me feel at home. Like to yeah. see that now this is the amount of care that's being put into not only let's tell this story, let's tell it now to the point that yes, yeah, just like, and to have an African director, it's an all black cast of 12. Mm -hmm. like so when I when you ask me like how's that going and like yes like but the end of last year was hard <laughs> and the end of last year was it was full but it wasn't it the abundance was not financial and that's annoying the older yeah. that you get because you're like but <laughs> yeah but like that's the thing that fills my soul that's mm -hmm. the thing that makes me excited that like and that there was an email of like hey let's start having the hair conversation oh yes because because I play the youngest of the three sisters, right? And we're talking mm -hmm. about, and I guess there's an ex expiration of like possibly being wigged and like, okay, like, um, yes, like we're going to get somebody to come in, like do your cornrows for you. Like these are things that sound really little if you're not, you know, in this world. And if you don't understand also black hair, the amount yeah. of time and love it, it deserves. It requires, yeah. but, like, it demands, it actually demands mm -hmm. it from you. <laughs> yes, it, like 
literally. And so I also feel like I'm on this really exciting precipice. Like I feel like I'm just on this crest of the wave where it's like, I know where we're coming from. I still also like you feel like I'm still early in my career. I still feel like I have most of it ahead of me, but I can see the way it's turning and I can see the integrity with which um, there's an enthusiasm to tell the story and to do it right. And I just, that didn't come from nowhere. It came from people like me and you and so many of the people I'm sure listening being like, I'm not seeing it done the way I want it to be done. But instead of taking that as a sign to say, I shouldn't do it, I'm taking it as a sign to say, I should do it even more. It's urgent. And all of that adds to the momentum where not only does a really big and very powerful um, theater company within the national landscape is now doing this with such like care and intention. Like, I think it just also like reverberates and also to like, the audiences of who's going to come in, like that's the stuff that like my soul feels like is so exciting. Yeah. What's the name of the play? Three Sisters. I will Three. send you, Ooh. I will send you all the things. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm so excited. Like, when does it open? Um, we open, I want to say February 29th. Is our oh, open. Black and History people, Month too. Yeah. So we start previews in the last week of, and oh, speaking of like, nin, 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 before I got the role, when they were just kind of like availability checks, like seeing, and I was like, I don't even know if I want to do this play. Cause sometimes, you know, sometimes people ask you to do projects and you're like, yeah, you're actually not that keen on it. So I was like, before I get excited, just because the email says at soapepper.com, let me just see if I even want to do this play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I sat down this year and like the way I feel like my ancestors are like, leading me somewhere the way I feel like my ancestors are leading me places and stuff like that like so I I got the script this is before I was offered the role I got the script and read it and then first of all when I saw the what the poster image was because they did it at the National Theatre in London mm-hmm. um it was three black women um just at with afros orange background and it was just just like very bare kind of like naked na- nakedish but not sexual Mm-hmm. Um, I just saw the poster and I just went, I have to be in it. Um, I'm, I'm, I want you to see the picture's not going to look good. Oh. The moment I saw that, I was like, I don't know what the hell this play is about, but I need to be in it. Oh <laughs> Read the play now. The first day in the play was, uh, takes place May 30th, 1960 something. And the day that I was sitting down to read the document was May 30th. I was like, like I was like oh, goosebumps. Then like the character that I was, I guess they were interested in me for. Um, it was her birthday. Um, and so she was like, yeah, the first scene, she's like painting her nails, it's her birthday. And um when I got the production schedule after being like offered the role and everything, and I was just like rereading it again, because I'm gonna read it a bunch of times before we even get into the room. Mm-hmm. I saw that on my birthday, I will be doing the scene where it is my birthday. And I feel like those little moments like that are not, that's, I don't think that's a coincidence. It's like, not a coincidence. That, that's like, that's like whatever, whether it's you believe in God, your ancestors, the universe, Kermit the Frog, Beyonce, whatever <laughs> it is that you pray to, like I feel yeah. a sense of being led. And so I'm, I, I feel really buoyed by those types of like little affirmations of like, yes, you're doing the right thing. And to be yeah. getting that on this place specifically at this time in Canada where everything you're saying, I agree, like we need more stories. There's still so much that needs to be done, but it makes me feel like, okay, this is we're the way we're supposed to be going in. Yeah, we're on our way. And like, oh my gosh, I do not personally, I do not believe in coincidences. I believe that life has been designed. The good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, mm-hmm. it is all designed. So those moments where it all comes together and it's like ding, 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 like it's intentional. I truly believe that. And mm-hmm. so like it's oh, it's so beautiful when those moments align. And oh my goodness, congratulations. I would love to see this play. Thank you. I oh. would love for you to see it. <laughs> I'm yes. so excited. And like oh my gosh. That my homework was there like 
they were like, oh, like, here's a video of like all of these different words in Igbo. And like, here's some movies that you watch. And they were just like sending me like that soul pepper theater as part of my prep to start the job that they're paying me a lot of money to do. We're sending me Nollywood films so that I yes. could like practice the accent. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> like we made it <laughs> look how far oh. we come my baby <laughs> and I think Amazing. holding on to that joy helps to like bridge some of like the hard parts and I don't ever want to yeah. like pretend that those parts aren't there or it's not challenging oh my gosh, or not they are scary or like you know but yeah that's kind of where I am and I think how I think my cultural awareness and experiences allow me to enjoy and focus on these types of uh little successes at this time yeah and speaking of successes I know we're running out of time here but I just want to ask you this question how do you inhabit your success like you've come such a such a long way man you've done so many amazing things how do you sit in it and be like yo you know how do you inhabit that success how do you how do you take that breath of like acknowledgement within yourself to kind of give yourself a pat on the shoulder or, you know, whatever that may look like. Like, what does that look like for you? Thank you for saying that. Um, I think the honest, the honest answer is like, I kind of don't. I don't really sit in it. Um, and I think that's like good and also sometimes not super healthy because I feel like the to-do list of what I feel like I'm meant to achieve in this life is so long that sometimes feeling like I'm not even at the halfway point, I, some, I sometimes don't feel motivated or sometimes I feel like okay this is a big like I can like if my friend was to tell me like oh like I just published a play I would literally throw them a party (laughs) but when it's for me I'm like "Ah," like I can be sort of dismissive about it and so I, I mean I'm always kind of I do sort of often sit down and try to kind of investigate that and so part of it is I think feeling like I just feel like there's so much more that I want to do like I haven't hit my own definition of success yet in terms of what I feel like I want to do and the impact that I have um so I need to be reminded when somebody reminds me then I'll be like oh yeah I should I do deserve to take a break or like I did just um do this great contract I should spoil myself with some of the money that I earned. Like I I need to be, I really do need to be reminded. So community is really important in that time. Family is really important because those people will humble you. Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yep. um, And so it's, it's still something that I'm learning to do and I'm not totally sure as to why I don't kind of celebrate sometimes. And also because also for me, I think that like, it's kind of just Tuesday. Like it doesn't feel like, I don't know if you relate to this too as an artist, but like there's certain things that I feel like are like really things that I would be like really prestigious that are very like super specific theater nerdy or like film nerdy. It's like, Mm -hmm. I get to work with this particular director and this person hired me as a consultant to do this thing. Whereas like doing a McDonald's commercial where my mom can share it on her WhatsApp, you know how the aunties love WhatsApp, right? Like, so what they, like what sometimes my family views as like the thing that's success versus the thing that I'm like, oh my gosh, can you believe that I I got called in for an audition for this thing? Like, it's not the same. So sometimes Mm -hmm. I do have trouble when I do feel like it's a thing that I want to like celebrate people around me don't always grasp that even my friends who are not in the industry don't really grasp that it's a big deal that I auditioned for this French film you know what I mean I know what you mean Um, it's it's a little bit of a, a dissonance but Try, trying my best to like I also just enjoy the journey so much and also like literally it's literally the exact thing that I'm here to do and so for me I feel like oh I don't mean to sound like <laughs> conceited but I feel like the awards and like some of those like those like big milestones feel to me like very much like I just feel like I'm so I say this with humility deserving of them that it doesn't fe- it doesn't feel like I'm getting a huge something that's huge or outside of the realm of my natural possibility it feels like yes and this is the thing that you do now like right. yes and then you finish this course and then you move on to the next course it's not yeah. like you know in university I don't didn't celebrate every single course that I finished mm-hmm. <laughs> some of the ones that were hard or that meant really a lot to me that I feel like I got out of I'm like yes mm-hmm. so What's your relationship with that stuff? Are Girl, you good? Are you asking me? 
Like um, I'm good at celebrating other people. Like maybe we just need to like hang out more because I'm great at keeping track of what other people do. But when it's me, I'm like, who did that? I, I honestly relate with that so much. I don't I don't feel like I've done anything. <laughs> to be honest, I feel like I have such a long way to go. And I think I don't know. I heard someone articulated as the overachieving ness with black women like black women just are in are for the most part overachievers like especially immigrants when you come to another country you know every all the sacrifices all the this and that and that that happened to bring you here and 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 now there's no excuse like you've you've been given all the 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 um keys quote and unquote of what you're supposed to of the path you're supposed to take to be successful right so um for me i i don't know how i celebrate it i don't know if i do celebrate it i just like if if you know my film gets selected for an, for you know an award or you know in a festival in a festival or you know i'm nominated for this award or i win this award i in the moment ah amazing what is next right yeah. like where is my next film oh my god i'm behind on my neck then i just spiral sometimes like yeah. it's it's a weird it's a weird thing where sometimes your wins remind you of how much work you still have to do and sometimes how much behind you still are like it, it's it's a weird thing <laughs> where i feel like my joy and i take pride in it and i i completely agree with you too like i i've put my blood sweat and tears into this i deserve it you know, with all humility, but also standing in that truly, right? I, I'm, a, I'm all these things, and I put all these, every single thing in me to create to, to be this and that. So when the winds come, when you start to be, you know, acknowledged and recognized here and there, it's like, yeah, you know, my, my mother's prayers are working, <laughs> or you know, like my heart, my hard work is paying off. But then I'm just starting. I have so much more to do. I have so much more to accomplish. And will those things be celebrated too? And will those things... So like for me sometimes, like I know and I relate with you in that way, like I need to do better. I'm, I'm again, the best at celebrating other people, right? Like a few of my friends um, <laughs> got uh, awards here in Calgary for the... Oh, what's the Calgary award again? Dora? Um, with like... Uh, oh, the yeah, the mm -hmm. best. Sorry, the Betty. Yes, girl. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm like, girl, yesterday's price is not today's price. Your price just went up. You feel me? But when it comes to me, I'm like, ah, 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 I, I have so much more to do. I have so much more to do, and I, I experienced that paralysis in a way. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't know. I we need to work on that, Makambe. <laughs> I, I think we do. I think also it just also shows me that like I think part of our I don't think it's a mistake that like we both have the same sort of like resistance around ourselves, but are very like quick to celebrate each other. So I think it's also about like sh making sure that we're showing up for each other in that way. And I yeah. also wonder if it's like if like, but here's the thing about winning like a Betty or a Dora. It's like, I have a really, I have mine over <laughs> near my kitchen, like, and near like my published plays and like there's yeah. and then the plays are like sitting like underneath this little jar of like sand that I took from like my grandfather's <laughs> village. Like I'm just Aww. it's just it's a little altar. But mm -hmm. I'm just which are great and I'm so I'm so glad that I have those awards, but they didn't pay me anything. Like I just have the awards. Right. right? So I wonder if sometimes like some of that some of that like feeling like not wanting like I don't feel like it's not all about money. But at the same time, if that award came with ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or so, like I feel like I would be able to breathe in a way that I don't always feel the privilege of. Because sometimes these awards, yeah. it's it's like a professional accolade, but it actually does not reflect in your bank account like that. Yeah. It's it, it can in terms of like yesterday's price is not to do, like. Yeah. today's price and tomorrow's price right but like mm -hmm. in terms of how you build that momentum it doesn't really it's not like now I'm a registered nurse and so now I have to make a minimum of this like I wonder if that's yeah. a part of it too it's like lots of negotiation. I think I I think I agree with that actually because um you know like you still gotta pay rent and if the award is not coming with you know a, a prize or whatever like I mean, it does pay off, like, you know, now you have that in your resume and people are like, oh, you won that? Like, would you, yeah. are you available to work on this? And, and you know, it does, sure. you know, help open doors. Um, but 
also like the reward is more work (laughs) it's more work truly like it literally is more work because now like you gotta (laughs) you have to go back and check your calendar oh okay okay i'm available here i'm available there and then you may overwork like you know because now you're in demand which is an amazing thing that is just i you know we're grateful for when we are um it just is the reality of well the in the um um, in instability of the industry is still very very much a thing right and so therefore like when you win these awards you're like yeah this is awesome and I'm grateful to my mom and my dad and my uncle and all my teachers and all these things and now I do still gotta pay rent this month so what is next <laughs> <laughs> so, real. so real but oh. thank you thank you so much for Kambe this has been amazing thank you so much for sharing your heart and your story and your journey um and before you go i got two more requests i just need you to sprinkle a word of wisdom like an african proverb something that your grandfather told you when you were growing up something that just you know that you you're holding on to that inspires you just a word Mm. of wisdom Mm. Ooh. Ooh, okay. So I just moved into a new apartment. I guess it wasn't new. I guess it was like nine months ago. What is time? But um, being in my own space, I sometimes like download all of these little like brilliant wisdom things or I hear things and I write them down. So they're kind of pasted all over my wall. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll share two if that's okay or what yeah, like that's really feeling like they're grounding me. Um. For, for those of us spiritual people who are like, yes, like pray for the thing, call the thing to you, you know, for that one, I'll say, number one, say the prayer, ask for the thing that you want. Number two, trust that it's been heard. Trust that your request has been received and has been answered. Tr- like trust that it's being answered. And number three, move accordingly. Hmm. Like move like whatever that means to you like ask ask the thing if ask the thing be clear about the thing trust that it's like they're like okay cool great it's a process and then move however it is you need to move to be in alignment with the thing that you've asked for knowing that it's coming and i know it sounds so easy and it's something that we've heard people say so many different ways of like you have to like when you want to manifest the thing, you just have to now be in alignment with the thing, but really like move accordingly. So what does that mean? Does that, so you want to be number one on a, on a call sheet for a TV show? Does that mean you're waking up every day at 1 30 PM? Does that mean that you're not eating right? If you're going to be on a TV show, that's going to need you for 16 hours a day. Are you physically ready to be that? Are you moving in accordance with being able to hold that mm-hmm. physically in terms of your craft, in terms of your voice work, your de- whatever that is to you, like move accordingly. The second piece that I would offer is um, uh, kind of about being bold, asking for what you want, taking risks, and hopefully a little bit of like support and armor as you're going into these spaces where they're not built for you and you kind of don't know how to navigate that. It's um, you don't bend to the will around you you bend the will around you. So go in strong knowing who you are, asking for what you want and bend the room to fit what it is that you know that your vision is. Rather than your first move being like, okay, okay, sir, thank you. How can I fit into please? Is it okay that I'm here? I'm just a little black immigrant. Never know how to, no, no. We're not moving like that in 2024. Hell yeah. That's, that's, my, that's my offer. Don't bend to the will around you. You bend the will. That's what you're here to do. And I know that you're here to do that because you have a feeling like you can do that. And if you didn't have that feeling, you wouldn't be meant to do that. Yeah. Oof. You bend the will around you. I receive that because mm-hmm. yes, I need, mm-hmm. I need, I need some of that energy, some of that boldness and courage to be yeah. honest. And I'm sure a lot of people do too. Um, so where can the people find you, find your work, you know, where, where can we where can we be fans man where, where can we stalk you where can we not stalk no where can we be fans where can we where can we see what you're doing um so I always kind of keep up with 
like anytime I'm doing something, I always post it on my Instagram. So the handle for that is arting with Makambe. Um, Makambe.com is also my website. So that's always got um, some insights. So if you want to see some of my past work, a little bit more about what my mission statement is as an artist and some things that I'm kind of interested in and cooking up, you can always find me there. Um, and yeah, uh, most uh, soon coming up, you'll get to see me at Soul Pepper Theater in Three Sisters, which runs from February 29th, if I'm not mistaken, to uh, March 17th. So yeah. Yay. Thank you so much again, Makambe. Thank you for being a part of the podcast. So I'm so glad. I'm so grateful. I'm thrilled. Thank you for having me. And I hope that everybody has an incredible uh, next chapter. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Awesome. Bye. See you all on the next episode. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Afros in the Diaspora. I hope this episode left you feeling inspired and hopeful. To engage, feel free to like, follow, share, and subscribe to Afros in the Diaspora on all social media and podcast platforms. Remember to leave a review and a rating. If you would like to be a guest, please reach out. Send an email to hi at afrosinthediaspora.com. That is hi at afrosinthediaspora.com. Or send us a DM on Instagram at Afros in the Diaspora. Remember, there is beauty in our stories and power in our voices. Together, we are stronger. Until next time.